All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to talk to you today about these approaches to studying uh, complex traits. So by complex traits, I think of the, the variation between individuals that is, uh, arises from the combination of both genetic and environmental factors, traits for which multiple genetic variants, uh, perhaps in multiple genes, contribute to uh, inter-individual variation or risk of a disease. Today we'll talk largely about variants that are common between, uh, in populations, such as those blue stars, and towards the end talk more about identifying the variants that are uh, lower frequency or rare in populations uh, and how they contribute to complex disease as shown in, um, by that yellow star. The identification of variants that contribute to complex traits and, and diseases um, is similar to uh, the approaches that would be used to find an autosomal dominant rare variant that might be traced in a family. So for example, if we're trying to identify such a variant and have a three-generation family and the blue individuals are the ones that are um, affected with disease, we might search through the genome looking for an allele at a marker such as this A1 allele that is found in all of the um, affected individuals but not found in the unaffected individuals. The same principle applies to looking for variants in uh, populations, but the time scale is uh, um, often longer. So for example, shown over here, uh, the individuals that have inherited a risk allele uh, are pr present in the, uh, uh, the present day, and they may share a common ancestor back many generations ago at this point here, uh, where a mutation arose um, that was then uh, inherited together. Now, more time has passed, more uh, recombination events have occurred around that uh, initial variant, and so the region around the um, uh, risk allele is probably smaller uh, in this kind of a setting than it is in a three-generation setting. So the principle of uh, genome-wide association studies that we'll discuss a lot today is to look at a large proportion of the variation across the human genome and look for um, alleles at variants that are associated with a uh, risk of disease or uh, variation in a, a, com a quantitative trait. Uh, and the, the uh, overall strategy is um, uh, 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 unbiased with respect to what the function of those alleles and what the function of those genes might be. The strategies by which one um, may find variants are um, influenced by the frequency of those variants and their effect size. So uh, shown here on the scale of allele frequency of, of uh, risk alleles, where common variants are typically defined as having frequencies of 5% or greater in a population, down to the rare variants that might be specific to an individual or a family. And the effect size of the variants on the y-axis, where a high effect size is uh, more causal uh, with respect to disease, uh, and those with more intermediate or modest effect sizes may be contributing towards risk of a disease or variation in a trait. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today are the, the genome-wide association studies have um, uh, fallen to sort of this area of the plot, common variants that um, can be identified through these strategies, and a lot of these have been found to have relatively modest or low individual effects. If there were variants that were common and had strong effects on disease, they would, um, they would be identified with this strategy. There just are not very many of them. And then as we move into talking about uh, sequencing-based studies, we're going to move sort of on this plot uh, to, towards the lower frequency variants that are able to be detected uh, once they are uh, analyzed. So genome-wide association studies in the past 10 or so years have been very successful at identifying loci um, across the uh, genome. This map shown here um, is from a database collecting together these uh, genome-wide association study loci that was originally uh, um, based here at NHGRI, at the NIH, and uh, now is uh, uh, based at this site where you can go and uh, look at uh, the, the uh, set of loci that have been identified for um, a range of different traits and their positions shown by these colored dots on the different uh, chromosomes. So today we're going to talk about uh, genome-wide association study design, uh, talk through the, uh, the identification of uh, samples and study participants, 
and then the genotyping uh, process and cleaning to tests of association between those variants and uh, the quantitative trait or risk of disease, uh, and some uh, aspects that are useful to um, identifying those variants using uh, um, imputation and meta-analysis. And then we'll talk about uh, interpretation of specific results, uh, the, the use of the uh, both effect size and significance when describing uh, an association, and we'll look at some example loci. And then finally talk about uh, where the field is moving as technology develops and sequencing allows more variants to be identified, uh, including those at those uh, lower frequencies. So study designs for looking at complex traits uh, can be cohort designs or case control uh, studies for a specific disease. So for example, a population-based cohort that uh, ascertains all members of a population without respect to uh, their status of health or, or disease, uh, uh, ascertains the individuals at uh, some uh, particular point and, and uh, analyzes them. A, a related type of study design is a prospective cohort where the individuals are ascertained early, uh, then various traits are measured over time, uh, waiting, for, say, for disease onset to then look at risk for disease. And then a case control design, when there's, a when there's a specific disease to be looking at, you can ascertain the cases and ascertain the controls, uh, um, enroll them, and then think what happened prior to disease onset. And here with a genetic-based study, we're asking what genetic variants are associated with the difference between the cases and the controls. So in a case control design, it's important to try to identify cases and controls that are uh, similar comparable in every way except for that uh, disease status. So try to identify, ascertain individuals that uh, have similar age, uh, that have a similar ratio of sex, for example, other demographic type data. If you want to enrich for the cases for the potential to identify variants that uh, cause disease or that influence disease, you might try to ascertain individuals that are more severely affected with that disease or require that cases have uh, other family members that are affected with that disease. There's a greater chance that then there's a genetic component, more of a genetic component than, say, an environmental component. Or if it's an older age of onset disease, look for the individuals that are affected earlier in life. They may have a greater uh, genetic load. When considering the uh, ascertainment of the controls, one could use a population based, just people who simply don't have disease, but perhaps it could enrich for uh, identifying genetic variants if you look for controls that have a lower risk of disease uh, rather than population-based samples, maybe perhaps individuals that don't have other family members affected with um, disease. Another important aspect is to try to match those individuals based on ancestry because allele frequencies differ between populations. So for example, the different shading here in the cases and controls represent individuals of different subpopulations that may have different allele frequencies of uh, variants across the genome. If there are ancestry differences, uh, say for in this example where there are more of one type of subpopulation in the set of cases than in the controls, then this can lead to uh, population stratification. It could lead to false positive associations between variants and uh, the risk of disease. So in classic confounding, uh, an exposure that's correlated with a true risk factor uh, but that's not causal can misleadingly be seen to be associated with disease. So we can adjust for um, that risk factor and eliminate the bias. For example, if you're measuring alcohol consumption and lung cancer, if smoking and drinking alcohol are related, um, if you don't measure smoking, then you may overestimate the risk of uh, drinking alcohol on lung cancer. In population stratification, a genotype that might correlate with a true risk factor, because both are correlated with the risk of disease, if you adjust for that true risk factor, you can eliminate the bias. So ethnicity per se does not explain the risk, but it's a marker of individuals that may have similar risk. For an example, allele that is um, 
has a gradient of allele frequency across Europe, from northern Europe to southern Europe, might track with a factor that affects risk of disease, such as a different dietary uh, factor that influences disease that differs between northern Europe and southern Europe. So that could induce population bias when um, studying the effect of that allele on disease. So population stratification is systematic differences in the allele frequencies between those subpopulations that might be due to um, different ancestry. And if you, especially in a case control study, if you oversample the individuals uh, from one group in the cases versus the controls, you can get spurious associations. Same principle applies to quantitative trait studies as well. So how can one account for or avoid population stratification? Well, one is to try hard to match those cases with the control so that there aren't subpopulations uh, present that differ between the groups. Could perform that study restricted to uh, one subgroup um, or try to adjust for that genetic background. So it could take the allele frequencies of the variants across the genome and use a principal component analysis to infer the ancestry from the genotype data and then adjust for those main factors uh, in the association analysis. An alternate strategy is to perform a family-based study design analysis that I'm not really talking about today, where you genotype the relatives and analyze the transmission of the alleles from heterozygous parents to offspring. Okay, so we've collected our, we've ascertained individuals for the study, now let's uh, genotype them. Genotyping uh, is a most efficient or cost-effective uh, when a standard set of variants um, are uh, present on a genotyping array that can be um, purchased and genotyped um, relatively inexpensively. Arrays are available that has, say, 10,000 to 5 million variants uh, pre-selected that are on them. Some companies that offer uh, commonly used genotyping products are Affymetrix and Illumina. And these arrays can be designed in different ways. Some arrays may have random variants or random single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome. Others have been selected to best represent the uh, variation uh, uh, between uh, populations, I'll show in a second. Some have copy number probes, some have a greater uh, um, collection of lower frequency variants on them to allow study of the, um, moving from those common variants into lower frequency. Some arrays have been designed specifically looking at variants in the coding regions of genes. Um, and some of these arrays have a preset uh, set, of, set of variants and then uh, the, the um, company allows you to select additional variants to be included on the array. So if you have variants of special interest to uh, follow up, those can be incorporated as well. This principle of selecting variants that represent the variation across the genome uh, builds on that idea of, of linkage disequilibrium and the similarities and differences between populations. So shown here, for example, are four example chromosomes with a set of uh, 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 variants in them and the haplotypes that can be comprised of those variants. And in this region, there are uh, a set of variants that are present, but the number of patterns that they represent is limited due to the relatively young age of the human species. The recombination does not happen uniformly across the genome. And so there are regions that are inherited still together in blocks. So selected variants uh, can, be, can be chosen that represent all of the variation present in any of these, uh, uh, by any of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you might identify an association with one variant and then uh, uh, follow it up by analyzing the other variants or considering that the other variants with the same pattern uh, in the population could be uh, causal or contributing to the disease. A couple of the strategies for the genotyping process, uh, the allelic discrimination um, uh, can be different in the different types of platforms. So here's one example um, where the uh, the the variants across the genome, the, the whole genomic DNA is used for the assay. Um, strategy is used to select and know which variant is being assayed at which position on the array. And the allelic discrimination in this case is a short primer extension 
where a primer is sitting here, and the allele that is incorporated depends on the allele that's present in that captured human genomic DNA. And then there's a visualization step, uh, in this case is using fluorescent staining to uh, enable a high throughput analysis of many, many different variants on a given um, array or bead chip. Here's a different strategy. There's still a target preparation step and a capture of the specific uh, regions of the genome at uh, given spots on the array. Uh, in this case, the allelic discrimination happens by uh, hybridization of two oligonucleotides and a ligation step that closes the gap between the, uh, the, one, the capture probe and uh, this additional probe. That ligation step is very specific and requires a perfect match of the nucleotides. If there's a mismatch, the ligation doesn't work so well uh, and that uh, uh, signal doesn't happen. And then the staining is dependent on uh, this uh, captured probe. Different arrays cover the genome, look at, uh, analyze portions of the genome at different, um, different uh, levels. So here are a set of example uh, genotyping arrays, and you can see the proportion of the, the uh, common variants across the genome that are sort of well represented by a SNP on the array, uh, and that can differ by the populations that are uh, present. Uh, that are being analyzed. And so, uh, depending on the amount of variation that exists in a population, one array may be, uh, do a better job than another in, in uh, capturing that information. So, when deciding which array to uh, genotype on individuals, you can consider how well it is likely to perform based on the, uh, the population those individuals are from. So, genotype data gets generated. There's a couple quality control steps that are important when analyzing uh, those uh, thousands uh, to millions of variants uh, and across the samples that were uh, collected. So one, one strategy is to tr identify the poor quality samples. If a given sample, a given DNA has a success rate um, that less than 95 percent of, of the variants were successfully genotyped that might suggest that that sample has lower quality and that the existing, the genotypes that are um, uh, uh, obtained might be uh, inaccurate. If there are too many heterozygotes amongst those genotypes, it could be that that DNA sample is contaminated with another DNA sample. You can look to try and identify whether samples are truly the people that uh, you think they are from the ascertainment. Are they the sex that you uh, believe that they will be based on the markers on the X and Y chromosomes? can look for unexpected related individuals uh, by doing a pairwise comparison of genotypes across the genome. And also look for duplicates, maybe an individual that participated twice in the study. The, the test of association is going to assume that everybody is uh, independent. You can also take those, the, the allele frequencies across the genome and look to see whether they are relatively uh, uh, similar across all members of the group to see whether they appear to be part of the same uh, ancestry group. Those are ways to evaluate the samples. You can also evaluate individual variants, individual SNPs. Again, if a SNP has low genotyping success across the individuals, then perhaps the genotypes that it is generating on the other individuals are uh, not accurate. If, if you include purposeful duplicate samples and identify some variants that are inconsistent between those samples, then those are maybe just not well-performing assays, should be removed. You can look at the proportion of the genotypes and compare the different genotype frequencies with their allele frequencies and use this to figure out whether the uh, assay is, is performing accurately detecting heterozygotes compared to homozygotes. If you have related individuals, such as parents and a child, you can look to see whether the alleles are being appropriately inherited in patterns. And also look for differential missingness between cases and controls that could generate some sort of bias if you're doing a case control study. Here's an example of looking at specific, uh, the, the results out of an individual genotyping assay where the two axes are the signal intensity for each allele of a, a, a dinucleotide, of a two, nucleotide, a two allele uh, variant. 
So samples that have high intensity of one allele and low intensity of the other would be one genotype. High intensity of the alternate would be the other homozygote genotype, and the heterozygotes uh, would be um, individuals in the middle. Here, nicely co colored correctly, uh, that the, the software analyzed in the data identifies those clusters and calls the genotypes automatically. However, in some cases, those clusters might get miscalled. In this case, both of these uh, sets of individuals were called as the heterozygotes, so these are sort of have an inaccurate genotype present. And sometimes those clusters are not very well defined. So sort of the most common type of problem, and then it's difficult to uh, accurately call the genotype um, of those individuals at the boundaries of the clusters. Those might be examples of variants that um, should be excluded or reanalyzed. Okay, so now we have the samples. We have genotypes on all the samples. Let's do the tests of association. So here we're looking at a quantitative trait. Uh, if we were to do a, uh, analyze whether a given variant is associated with a quantitative trait, a, a typical approach might be to use a linear regression type uh, strategy. So in this case, our uh, trait that we're looking at is toe size, and we're asking, is there a given uh, variant, a given SNP here, RS123456, what's its uh, um, effect size for its relationship between that SNP genotype and toe size? So shown plotted here for a given SNP, perhaps its two alleles are A and G, and if the individuals that are homozygous for the A allele have generally lower toe size and the individuals with the G allele tend to have a higher toe size, this, the slope of this line is showing that relationship uh, between the, um, the allele and toe size and would represent a um, association. In reality, there will be some covariates that may also be associated with uh, that trait that we'd like to remove the effect of so that we're really more precisely measuring the effect of that uh, variant on association. So maybe sex and age are associated with toe size, maybe body size is associated with toe size. We would remove the effects of those covariates in the uh, linear regression so that the, we're focusing on the relationship of what's, what's left to explain of toe size uh, by this variant. Now the assumptions in this analysis are that the trait is normally distributed for each genotype um, and that the subjects are, are uh, unrelated from each other. If we're looking at a case control study, or a, uh, we can calculate then the odds ratio. So th this measure, we would analyze the, uh, the number of cases and the number of controls that, have, uh, that carry each allele, say A and C, of a given uh, genotype, and calculate that odds uh, ratio. And look at that, uh, the amount of risk. So in this case, uh, values of um, this value of 1.33 is representing increased risk of disease um, for this uh, variant. Here's an example looking at uh, odds ratios of a number of different studies that looked for association between a given variant and uh, type 2 diabetes risk and shows how odds ratios and their confidence intervals can be displayed. So on the x-axis here is odds ratio for type 2 diabetes, a value of 1, uh, shown here and by that dotted line uh, top to bottom, is no risk of that uh, variant on, on type 2 diabetes. And so you can see in a, given, in a given study, here this top one is from a study based in Iceland, the odds ratio is shown here by this, um, the black symbol, and the uh, confidence interval around that is shown by the horizontal line. This confidence, this is a 95% confidence interval. Since it doesn't overlap this uh, uh, odds ratio of 1, then that's a significant result at a uh, 5% false positive rate. You can see a number of other studies that would have identified significant results. And here's a study that was, uh, had a, a confidence interval that spanned 1. It, on its own, would not show uh, significant evidence of association. But the data can be combined together uh, and shown in, in uh, uh, together that the, the um, odds ratio is significant and has a smaller um, confidence interval. The ability to identify a significant association depends quite a lot on sample size. Shown here is the relationship between genome-wide association study sample size and statistical power. 
with odds ratios here on the x-axis and the uh, amount of power that, um, to detect that an association shown on the y-axis with the different colors of lines representing different sample sizes. So at a more modest uh, sample size, uh, only the strongest effects, the uh, variants that have the highest odds ratios, uh, can be detected in some of those even with not very much power. Whereas as the sample sizes get larger, you can see that there's quite good power to detect associations that have uh, uh, more modest uh, odds ratios. When a whole set of variants across the genome are analyzed, we can then go use that data, use those association statistics to look for any evidence of uh, population substructure and to try and account for it. So uh, here the, uh, the results of the statistical test, in this case it's showing um, a chi-square uh, test, are plotted against the expected values from a uniform distribution. So if there was no evidence of association, it was a perfectly designed test, then the variance might fall completely on this uh, uh, line that's uh, of uniform results. Uh, if the association results have, are more significant than you would expect at an early step, at an early um, across more of the um, distribution than expected, this can be evidence that there's population substructure. The variants that might represent the true associations are the ones that show the strongest, the, the, the greatest effects or that are most significant, and you would expect some of these to be off the line if there are uh, true associations present. But you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be uh, a uniform uh, uh, distribution early on that's uh, representing uh, um, in, in a study. So this could represent that they're population outliers or structure. Now sometimes it's unavoidable in a study to uh, remove those individuals if there's a lot of complex relatedness uh, within the study. And so one approach to uh, account for that is, uh, has been proposed here in this genomic control value. You can calculate a value that represents how much in, uh, these uh, uh, association statistics are inflated and then adjust for it and report the association statistics after adjustment to try and account for that uh, increased evidence of association. So we perform that test of association, we can plot them across the entire genome and the results might look like this. So here's an example of a, a genome-wide association study data for variants that are across the um, autosomes of the genome, uh, lined, lined up end-to-end -end, uh, across the x-axis here. And the um, statistical evidence of association by the p-value is shown on the y-axis, uh, and it's a minus log 10 of the p-value so that the most significant results are higher up on the, on the graph. Uh, and these are often named Manhattan plots because ideally what you see are a lot of uh, tall buildings of signals here that represent uh, true associations that are more significant than you'd expect by chance. Well, how many would you expect by chance? How many associations would you expect by chance? We do a lot of statistical tests here. Oops. So if we test several hundred thousand variants up to millions of variants, uh, uh, to determine what that um, appropriate level of significance is, we need to consider how often you'd expect a result by chance. So um, when considering only the common variants, it's been estimated that in a, say, European ancestry population, there are approximately one million common variants that are present across the genome. If we might typically consider a p-value of 0.05 to be significant, then uh, an adjustment that accounts for that uh, million, uh, approximately a million SNPs that are um, uh, tested would suggest that the threshold we should use to call something significant is 5 times 10 to the minus 8th. So to achieve this level of genome-wide significance, we need either a large effect or a larger sample size. One strategy, so the two principles I'm going to talk about now are imputation and meta-analysis that help allow, make it possible to get larger sample sizes by combining data sets together. 
So the principle behind imputation is uh, such as this. If one study has tested variants that are present on, uh, across the genome and each tick mark representing sort of across some genomic region, the variants that are uh, analyzed, and another study may have used a different uh, genotyping array and uh, um, analyzed a different set of variants. Uh, we can combine these data together by uh, imputing or predicting the genotypes that would be present at a much denser set of variants across the genome, and thereby, if each study can impute this greater set of variants, then instead of just the subset that overlaps between these two studies be analyzed, we can um, analyze a much larger subset of the uh, variants across the genome. So, for example, if here's a study sample that I have uh, of a given individual and I've typed it at three different variants across a region and at this position they're heterozygous for the A and G alleles, here they're heterozygous, here they're homozygous for the A alleles, I can compare the genotypes that are observed to a reference panel of samples that have been genotyped uh, more densely at markers across the genome. Perhaps those samples came from the HapMap. A study that uh, analyzed variants across the genome, or more recently, a denser imputation panel available from the Thousand Genomes Project, or as more and more sequencing studies are taking place in populations around the world, uh, newer uh, panels are being identified that will allow a greater ability to impute a larger number of variants across the genome. So in these reference samples that have much denser genotyping, um, the, the haplotypes are uh, inferred. And then we compare the um, genotypes from the, uh, that were observed to those haplotypes to identify the best match amongst the sets of uh, variants across the region. So in this case, the best matches might be of these, uh, uh, this haplotype may be the best match for the, uh, the uh, this set of uh, alleles, whereas a combination of these two different regions might be the best match for the um, other set of alleles. Then these matches can be used to impute the missing genotypes at those other uh, positions. And a number of approaches, statistical approaches, have been identified to do this, and uh, they come along with uh, uh, measures of the likelihood that a given genotype is accurate uh, at a given position, depending on how well it is uh, tagged, how well, how frequently it's uh, represented uh, only with one set of nearby variants as opposed to uh, multiple sets. So in this way, a given set of data can be used to um, impute and, and analyze a much larger uh, set of variants across the genome. Here's an example of a region uh, of, of the genome where uh, the evidence of association is shown uh, for LDL cholesterol, and we're near the, um, the LDL receptor gene, and the variants that are shown in red were the ones that were directly genotyped by a given study, and you can see that none of those showed very strong evidence of association. The variants shown in blue are the ones that could be imputed by, uh, uh, by comparison to a a better reference panel, and you can see that there are variants then that can be identified that showed stronger evidence of association. So this increased coverage of the genome can allow signals to be identified that might otherwise have been missed. Imputation also allows then those studies that genotype different platforms to combine the data together. So combining genome-wide association study data by meta-analysis, uh, we can um, combine studies together, a larger study might be given more weight because it has more uh, precision at uh, estimating what the effect size would be, and will gain increased power compared to looking at the individual studies. We can also look to see whether those effect sizes are consistent across the studies or whether there might be some heterogeneity in that effect size, perhaps due to differences in the environment or different contributions um, uh, of that variant or that locus uh, to that disease in a group. So perhaps different studies define the phenotype a little bit differently. Uh, perhaps the genotyping and other analysis strategies led to some sort of heterogeneity between the groups or uh, those environmental differences. So some common meta-analysis methods that are uh, available. Uh, one main category is a p-value based um, meta-analysis. Uh, that's also, then you'd want to take into consideration that direction of association, whether variants associated with increased or decreased risk. 
And another main strategy is to compare those effect sizes, such as the betas from the, uh, the linear regression or comparing the, um, the, the, the odds. Within that type of meta-analysis, you can perform either a fixed effect meta-analysis. This is assuming that each of the individual studies has the same um, effect, uh, a same level of effect of uh, the variant risk on disease. If that's true, then a fixed effect analysis would increase the power to detect an association. A uh, random effects approach would allow there to be some heterogeneity between the studies uh, and, and permit that, and if there's still an underlying shared association, can detect it. Other methods exist as well. Okay, so we have now identified our samples and genotyped them and done the tests of association. Uh, let's uh, consider how to interpret those results. So here is our uh, Manhattan plot for um, uh, HDL cholesterol from this uh, particular example. And what's emphasized here is the p-value for association. Looking at the a table that represents uh, those uh, loci, you can see that each association result is reported to um, show what a lead variant is at that association uh, and which allele of that variant is associated with increased or decreased risk of uh, or uh, trait value here, uh, HDL cholesterol. Uh, so both effect size and the um, evidence, the p-value for association are shown. So in this red box here, you can see a locus. It's named by two uh, nearby genes and a marker that represents uh, that locus and its location in the genome. And uh, the two alleles are shown here. In this particular case, it's shown with the minor and major alleles in this population, so which one had a frequency below 50 percent and which one is above 50 percent, and then effect of a given allele. And this is represented different ways in different studies. Here they, uh, it's presented with the effect of allele A1. A1 is this minor allele, so we can go figure out that it means the uh, G allele at this variant. So a G allele has a positive effect on uh, that trait. So the G allele is associated with increased HDL, whereas the T allele is associated with decreased HDL. And here in 181,000 individuals, the p-value was uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 8th. So all of the data can be represented both by an effect size and um, a p-value. So the results, uh, zooming in and looking at a particular locus, um, these are, uh, we're identifying loci and we don't yet know what the underlying genes might be. And this remains a challenge at some loci. Some are easier to interpret than others. Um, so here are some examples of what the association results might look like. Uh, in this case, uh, the evidence of association, we've zoomed into a region on uh, chromosome 8 and I've chosen these results from uh, different studies. I think it's easiest to look at these plots when every variant has been tested in a similar sample size. So you can see in this particular region there's a whole cluster of variants uh, in this region that show similarly strong evidence of association. Uh, and the location of these variants is uh, in a region right near a, uh, a gene that might be a good candidate gene for this uh, trait based on its uh, previously known uh, biology. Sometimes a signal is identified, as in this case, a set of variants that show evidence of association, again, in a pretty narrow region of the genome, but there are no protein coding genes right here in the nearby uh, region. There are protein coding genes nearby, um, you know, 100 kilobases away that uh, could be good candidates. Or it could be that there are non-protein coding genes in the region or regulatory elements that these variants are uh, influencing to act upon uh, one of these genes or others um, nearby. Some loci, the evidence of association is not narrow, in fact is a sort of a broad signal uh, where multiple genes uh, may, may be in that, uh, in that region. So, there might be many different candidate genes here. Looking at the literature may, may or may not be useful to try and identify what an underlying candidate can be. When the locus is named in a paper, um, it can often will use the 
uh, names of some nearby genes to help represent the signal. Those may or may not be the most biologically relevant uh, genes to the symbol. You can see in this case, the lead variant is over here on this end of the, uh, 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 of the sort of plateau of signal, and so these genes were named, and these look like good candidates for uh, uh, this, uh, that could be contributing to the trait here. However, if one of these other variants had shown stronger evidence of association, it could be that some of these other genes might have been named as the signpost um, to represent that signal. So the important lesson here is to interpret the locus names with some caution. Many of them are nearly, nearly the nearest gene to a signal, but are not necessarily the underlying gene that, is maybe gene that may be responsible for that signal. So here's an example, uh, again, back to that HDL cholesterol uh, uh, locus, where uh, the, the um, study used several different methods to try and interpret what the underlying candidate genes could be at a given locus. So uh, shown here, again, is uh, each row is representing a locus that was identified by the study. And the columns here are uh, several different approaches to try and identify what might be the good candidate genes nearby that could be uh, influencing the signal. So one approach is to go to the literature and look at uh, the genes that are in this region. Now, what's in the region? Maybe it's within 500 kilobases, maybe it's within a megabase of the, of the lead association signal, and ask when, whether any of the genes have been implicated in a uh, biological function that might be relevant to the disease in some uh, previous study, maybe in an animal model uh, study or in some biochemical study that's analyzed uh, uh, and shown what the function of some gene might be. So you can see some examples here that were um, identified at some of the low side, but um, not all of them, that can, might help suggest that those, variant, that those genes play a role. Another approach is to say, well, a variant that changes the protein sequence uh, that shows evidence of association with the trait might have a higher chance of uh, being involved in being responsible for that signal uh, than one that's in any other location within the gene or, or um, outside the genes. And so variants that are part of those association signals at a given locus um, can be identified. And so at some loci, there are multiple genes that show uh, such variants, and others, it might point to a single uh, gene that maybe uh, has a better chance of um, being involved in the disease. Another approach is to ask whether those variants that are associated with a trait are also associated with the level of expression of a nearby gene. So this is an expression quantitative trait locus analysis performed the same way as a genome-wide association study, but now the trait that's being analyzed is not say HDL cholesterol, but expression of uh, gene one, how, how do the variants, uh, do the variants show association with higher or lower expression of that gene, and then across the entire genome, so look at say 20,000 genes and their evidence of association with expression, and ask whether the same variants are associated with expression. So here at this locus, variants that are associated with HDL are also associated with, should associate with the level of RBM5 gene expression. So perhaps in this case, the variants influence RBM5 gene expression, and that's what leads to uh, the effect on the trait. And then finally, different strategies are being identified to try to uh, use the fact that multiple loci show evidence of association with the trait and combine together the data of those different loci, the genes that are present at those different loci, to look for patterns or collections of, of genes that may help together uh, implicate in a particular uh, pathway or help identify a given gene. So it, several different approaches um, um, have been developed to do that, say using text mining to identify all the potential relationships between genes in a given region and a trait, looking across loci and see if any of the similar patterns are identified, uh, and then suggesting that uh, if a given gene in a locus shows that kind of pattern, that maybe it's a stronger candidate for uh, playing a role. So you can see from this example that it's not straightforward to necessarily identify what the underlying uh, genes are at these loci, so it leaves uh, uh, future biological studies um, to figure some of that out. Loci can also be a little bit complex. There may be more than one common variant that are associated with 
uh, a particular uh, uh, trait that are located nearby each other uh, in the genome. So shown here are two signals that are independent of each other that are both associated with the trait. This is the same plot uh, shown twice but colored a little bit differently. So the overall evidence of association, there's sort of these two main uh, humps of uh, variants that show evidence of association. These variants here in the top plot shown in this uh, uh, gray rectangle are inherited in a very similar pattern to one another and show evidence of association with the trait. And so do these variants shown in that uh, lower plot also show evidence of association with that trait, but they're not present in the same uh, frequency as these, uh, the upper set of variants uh, and they're not inherited in the same pattern. So two underlying signals may be influencing the uh, trait in this region. Uh, uh, variants in, the, in uh, this top signal are include some that are located right at the promoter of this gene and so uh, may be influencing that gene's expression through promoter activity. Some of these variants could be influencing this same gene or maybe even a different one um, through a more of a long distance um, regulatory kind of function. One way to identify whether two signals are independent from each other or distinct from each other is to perform a conditional association analysis. So uh, when testing for association, instead of just having one variant being analyzed, consider two variants being present. So if we're looking for the effect of one variant independent of that other variant, we'll uh, include both in the analysis and then look specifically to ask whether that one variant still remains associated with the trait even after accounting for that other variant. And of course, we'll include other covariates that may be influencing that trait as well um, to ask whether those SNP effects for, say, these two SNPs are independent from uh, one another. So if one of those effect sizes changes when the other one's included in the model, then um, it would show that they are at least sometimes inherited together in the same pattern. If neither of those effect sizes changes when the other is included in the model, then those two SNPs are independent. Uh, from each other and represent two clearly uh, distinct signals uh, from one another. If a signal is shared in its association across different populations, then it's possible to combine data from different populations to narrow the location of that shared signal, uh, taking advantage of the different uh, linkage disequilibrium that's present in different populations. So shown here is an example of a, an association signal um, in a given uh, region on chromosome 8 in a European study and the variants that show evidence of association show sort of a broader uh, signal uh, here, whereas uh, that's the same variants tested for association in an African American uh, study showed a much narrower signal. Um, with some shared variance between those two signals. And this may reflect if there's truly a single underlying variant responsible for these associations in these two populations, may reflect that um, more uh, historical recombination of events have happened around the signal in uh, the African American population than in the European population, and suggesting that it's possible to use these data together to narrow in on what the signal, uh, best representation of that signal may be that might help identify what the underlying variants are and uh, better determine how they are related to a nearby gene. Okay, so a lot of the results that I've shown uh, so far have been focused on common variants and their association with uh, complex traits. And the use of genome-wide association studies and uh, the uh, genome-wide arrays that focus on common variants uh, to identify those relationships. Now I'd like to move on to how the use of sequencing, exome sequencing and genome sequencing uh, is allowing rarer, lower frequency variants and rarer variants to be identified and how those uh, can also be related to complex traits. And in some cases, different statistical methods are needed to uh, consider those lower frequency variants because they're present in fewer individuals and it's harder to see the evidence of association in reasonable sample sizes. So here's a, an overview of some strategies that can be taken to look for lower frequency and rare variants affecting complex traits. 
So in addition to the genotyping-based uh, uh, strategies, uh, exome sequencing, looking at the sequencing the coding regions of the uh, genes across the genome, and, and genome sequencing uh, can be performed. Different strategies for analyzing that sequence data through variant genotype and calling are, are, um, are performed. As, um, and then in both cases, the variants that are identified can be uh, potentially used in an imputation-based strategy to identify additional variants nearby using reference panels. Then the variants can be, as we described um, earlier, analyzed one at a time in a single point test of association, each variant uh, asking whether or not it shows association with disease, and then this may require some replication, follow-up, and additional samples um, of that variant to see if it represents a true association. A new strategy, though, that will allow those lower frequency variants to be um, identified and to identify a gene that implicate a gene, even when the frequency of the underlying variants is lower, is a locus-based association analysis, or this is sometimes called a gene-based association analysis, or a, a burden test, looking at the collection of variants uh, that show association. In this case, you could follow up those specific variants that are identified, or perhaps sequence additional individuals uh, for a gene that's identified because they may have yet different variants that are involved in uh, the risk or trait. So some sequencing study designs uh, for complex traits. Here are a few examples. One might choose to sequence selected individuals, say from a trait distribution, choose the individuals with the most extreme trait values, the highest and the lowest trait values, or if it's a disease, choose cases and controls and look for uh, variants that differ between those um, two groups. Strategies to increase the number of individuals um, could either be to decrease sequencing coverage. I guess I should say that sequencing is still expensive, and so strategies are really designed around cost-effective approaches for identifying these associations. So it's feasible to sequence individuals at a lower coverage of the genome and uh, thus be able to it, um, identify variants uh, across the genome, but perhaps with less uh, confidence at a given variant. Or uh, variants that are identified by a set of sequencing studies, say a set of exome sequencing studies, could then be identified from those studies collected, put together on a genotyping array that's more cost-effective for follow-up in other uh, studies. And another strategy may be to sequence population isolates, where rare variants may have drifted by chance to higher frequencies that allow them to, the association between those variants and the trait to be detected. And that association may be true, the function of that variant on a gene and in a trait may be true in other populations, but just harder to detect because it's observed uh, so few times. So an example of this top strategy, sequencing selected variants, is shown here. Here's a, an, an early study looking at the extremes of uh, body size. So in this study, they sequenced the coding regions and splice junction regions of a number of uh, uh, genes in a set of obese individuals and a set of lean individuals. And here in this uh, uh, region, they show the results for one gene, uh, this MC4R gene, and there are different variants that are present in uh, different uh, individuals. You can see that the, the number of individuals that these variants were found in uh, is small on their own, one and two. They then went and followed up and asked whether these variants that are present in, uh, at rare uh, frequencies have a functional effect on the gene. And in fact, many of them do. Some of them have a severe effect and intermediate effect. So the variants they are harder to identify from an association study of lots of individuals, but they're present and they can have functional um, effects. Another strategy to identify low frequency variants uh, for a complex trait might be to look specifically at variants. Uh, near to loci that have been identified from genome-wide association studies. 
So these are, say, looking at the genes that are nearby a, a, a association signal. These might be called positional candidates. We're choosing them as candidate genes based on their position uh, and, and analyze them in uh, cases of neutrals or, again, individuals with different trait values and look for variants that are present in one group and not in the other. And the, the thought here being that we're not necessarily identifying the variants underlying the genome-wide association study signal itself, but perhaps can identify variants that will implicate a given gene in that region. So uh, identifying variants that affect the gene function and lead to the same disease or trait can be used to implicate, say, a gene at that um, genome-wide association study signal. So shown here is an example of that strategy at a given gene for uh, type 1 diabetes. So the, uh, in this study, they sequenced uh, the exons and splice sites of 10 uh, candidate genes uh, from a set of 480 patients and 480 controls. And then they uh, followed up the, the variants that they identified, they followed up by testing for association in uh, more than 30,000 subjects. So in this particular gene with the uh, domain shown uh, uh, below here, they identified a set of variants. Uh, some of these are variants at splice uh, site positions that could influence the splicing of the gene and, and lead to um, different functional product. There are stop codons present and also uh, missense uh, variants. And shown here are the association results. So in this case, we're going to focus on the left uh, sort of half of the table from this case control study. You can see that there are four variants that, that are shown and the, uh, the two alleles that are present. And so here in the cases versus the controls of this variant, the frequency of these variants is quite low. Uh, and you can see that the controls have a little bit higher frequency of the rare variant than the cases do. So this uh, variant, this low frequency variant, uh, um, the, the variant is protective for disease. The association is with a lower risk of disease, this odds ratio below uh, one. So the frequency of this uh, variant is, the common variant is higher in the, uh, the cases. All four variants here are showing some um, evidence of association, strongest with this lead variant, but also association with these other, these splice site variants and this other coding variant even though they're present in not very many uh, individuals and have quite low uh, frequencies. So it's the collection of the variants together that helps establish the role of this gene uh, in type 1 diabetes and uh, sh showing that the, sort of the collection of variants together can help implicate a gene in disease. Suggests that IF, this, uh, this IFIH1 gene may be uh, also playing a role in the common risk variants identified from the GUS study. So th the idea that we would, could use multiple variants in a gene, so from that MC4R study, variants found in one and two individuals each, uh, these low frequency variants shown, shown here, it's collecting them together that's helping to uh, implicate the gene in disease. So the strategy can be used in larger studies uh, in a broader uh, sense, not just in candidate genes, but looking across the gene, by trying to, uh, across the genome, by looking at genes and trying to identify an increased burden of variants or the set of variants together that can help implicate a single gene or a locus. So the principle, again, is that many of these variants might be on their own too rare to observe the evidence of association in the hundreds or thousands of samples that um, exist. Um, but there may be more than one variant that's present in, in different individuals that help implicate that gene. So the idea behind the gene-based tests is to uh, capture that set of variants together um, to look for uh, evidence of association with, um, say, case control status as shown here or um, for the quantitative trait. So some variants are shared between cases and controls, and especially the common ones uh, uh, may not be um, driving the difference between the cases and controls in this case, but there might be different variants in different individuals that are, say, more common in the cases than they are in the controls. And that together, especially if those are functional variants that you think really could be influenced the, the uh, effect of that gene, then identifying those in a way that's statistically sound can be useful to uh, implicate that gene.
So these rare variant burden tests are gene-based tests. The principle is to collapse the information from multiple variants into a single uh, statistical test. So one way you might think about that is to count the risk alleles across a set of variants uh, in the cases and compare it to the controls. Now, different statistical tests have been developed. Some of these will allow the direction of effect of each variant to be different. You could imagine variants in a gene that increase its gene function. You could also imagine other variants in that same gene might decrease its gene function. Both could be involved in implicating, uh, 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 affecting risk of disease. And then the choice of which variants to include in doing that statistical test can have a big impact on the test. So if we include too many variants that have no effect at all on the uh, risk of, of disease, then that'll sort of decrease the power of the test. If we can somehow figure out what the, or guess what the likely relevant variants are, then that'll give us the greatest power to see a difference. So we might filter the variants and look for, uh, say, only missense variants that change the protein sequence of the gene, or look for ones that have a lower allele frequency. Perhaps those are more likely to be uh, involved here, or perhaps we could look for those with a predictive function, try and predict, say, which amino acid changes will lead to loss of function of the protein or which have a likely functional uh, impact on that uh, sequence. Here's a set of the many, this is an active area of research developing these tests, and here's a, a, a list of the different strategies that have been um, uh, identified, different statistical tests to try to identify uh, association in this collected set of variants. Uh, some of them use different um, strategies of uh, looking at, at all the variants that may, requiring them to act in the same direction, others that allow that uh, direction to, to be different for the different variants increasing or de decreasing um, risk uh, that are implement implemented in different strategies and have different um, approaches towards trying to um, uh, uh, do that test of association. I'm going to show one example of a, of, um, of a gene-based test, and this is looking at loss of function variants uh, in a gene SLC30A8 and uh, an identification that, those, that, that, that the set of variants protect against type 2 diabetes. So in an initial study um, where uh, some young, lean type 2 diabetes cases and some older, um, obese uh, controls were sequenced to try and increase the difference between the, the, the increase the potential of identifying risk alleles. Um, a, uh, a group identified a set of variants and then tested those variants for association in some um, another six to seven thousand cases and controls. They found a nonsense variant. It was in seven cases and 21 controls. So that is nominally significant, a p value of about 0.05. Um, uh, and that variant is associated with reduced risk of disease, right? It's present in a higher proportion of the controls than it is a proportion of the cases. So that's nice, but uh, a p-value of 0.05 is not so convincing um, if, if testing a lot of variants across the, uh, across the genome. So this variant was included on one of those high-throughput arrays that was then tested in many, many, many more individuals uh, from different studies. Uh, in 48,000 individuals, uh, the, the association persists, a p-value of now um, uh, 6.7 times 10 to the minus third. So uh, continuing support for a role of this variant. Now, it's difficult to increase the sample size beyond this because that variant is it's, it's not very common. It arose in what appears to be Western Finland and is most common in Western Finland and just really not present so much around the rest of the world. So it's going to be hard to show more evidence of association with that variant um, given the restrictions of people available. So they expanded to look at more variants in the gene and in other populations. So that initial association of the, of the, um, stop, the nonsense variant, so arginine to a stop codon, uh, that was identified is uh, shown up here at the top, and that uh, p-value of 6.7 times 10 to the minus third is the collection of um, uh, uh, individuals um, uh, analyzed for that given variant. Uh, here is an additional variant uh, 
this uh, uh, frame shift variant that was originally identified in an Icelandic study uh, that also shows some evidence of association. It was observed both in Iceland and in Norway and has a p-value on its own of uh, 0.0019. It's also a protective variant, a loss of function variant in the gene that's also protective. When looking across samples from a wider range of uh, populations around the world, other variants are identified, uh, shown, shown here. Some are um, nonsense uh, variants, some of them are uh, frame shifts that will change the protein sequence. Um, some of them are substitution variants. Collectively, they're present in, say, one case, one control, not very, not very large sample sizes. However, when you collect the, all of that data together, you see that there's still a, um, a protective uh, effect of these loss of function variants um, together on uh, association with type 2 diabetes. So those together have a p-value of 0.0021. Collecting all the variants together across all of these studies um, in, in, is effectively what that gene-based test is doing and shows a much more significant association at 10 to the minus 6, um, um, showing a role of uh, variants that are loss of function in this gene and their uh, risk together on uh, type 2 diabetes. So this is sort of an example of the strategy of collecting together the variants. You can uh, imagine how identifying the set of the choice of which variants to include can influence the test and the uh, use of different variants across the different populations may be needed if there are a lot of individually rare uh, variants that are found. Okay, and then finally, here's an example of a um, more recent uh, uh, sequencing-based study to sort of show uh, what the state of the art is and maybe uh, what's coming. This is uh, from the uh, UK 10K uh, sequencing study and the approaches that they use that collect together the different things that we've uh, talked about. So uh, they had a set of um, cohorts together and they performed both uh, single variant uh, tests in whole genome uh, sequencing data. Uh, in this case, they did the whole genome sequencing data in about 3,800 individuals and then followed up those variants by looking at an additional uh, 9,000 uh, individuals. By doing that sequencing, they identified more than 13 million uh, variants uh, that were present and uh, did some tests of association. Another strategy was to uh, use the uh, whole genome sequence data but focus on variants in the exome and then uh, perform some gene-based tests on the variants that were found with frequencies less than 1% in the exome. And shown here are different strategies for choosing which variants to include in those uh, tests. And the number of genes that were analyzed uh, differs by whether there are variants that um, were found in those, uh, that meet those criteria in the tests. And then finally, they used the genome-wide data from the whole genome sequencing and uh, did some, some uh, burden tests uh, choosing selected variants in uh, windows across the genome. So you can imagine how to identify which variants to collect together when looking at the coding regions of exons. You can choose which variants have protein coding changes. And they're expanding this into, well, how do we look at the variants in the other parts of the genome that made together themselves collectively, say, work together on the same regulatory element or things like that to uh, help identify rare variants in non-coding regions that collectively together uh, may influence risk of disease. So shown here is a plot of the variants that, that have been identified in this uh, study. Again, getting back to the, um, from the beginning, looking at the relationship between uh, minor allele frequency and uh, the effect size on these axes. And uh, a lot of the variants that, that they identified are uh, common, uh, common variants. And you can see that by doing these sequencing-based studies, they're uh, moving on this axis up into being able to look at the lower frequency uh, and rare variants. And uh, to detect them, um, a lot of these uh, end up needing to have a little bit higher uh, effect sizes given the sample sizes available. Okay, so all together, uh, the different approaches, common variants, rare variants, looking at susceptibility variants, 
uh, the value of uh, these, these uh, variants uh, largely will um, likely be to influence um, the potential to identify new biology related to uh, risk of the, these uh, traits and diseases. So perhaps the variants help implicate new target genes uh, for the development of, of uh, uh, drugs that may be used to treat those uh, traits or diseases. They may also um, help identify different biomarkers of uh, disease that might help predict who's uh, going to become affected uh, with disease. At the moment, a lot of the variants have relatively modest uh, individual effects on uh, risk, though some may be identified that would help uh, at the personalized level uh, eventually lead to uh, better diagnostic or um, uh, prognostic approaches to learning about complex traits. So I think the future of complex trait analysis, these different approaches, technology continues more and more loci are being identified, more groups combine data together, larger meta-analysis uh, as possible. And then the, the, the sort of functional translation, figuring out, following up on those signals, looking in more diverse populations, um, identifying more of the rare variants that may be contributing to uh, association uh, will allow then better understanding of the biology disease. So some of those variants may be involved in, combined together in, in uh, sets of variants that together affect a gene or a trait. Uh, different variants may be influenced by different environmental stimuli, and the combination of those gene-gene, gene-environment interactions together will have a greater ability to explain uh, complex traits. And then eventually following up on those genes and on the individual variants that are identified can help understand, help us all understand the mechanisms by which variants can lead to these complex diseases. So, thank you very much for all your attention. If you have any questions, please come down to the podium.